Bro, you know how much that thing weighs? Do I know? Yeah. I know 24 times. Bro. Oh, <laughs> Listen. Oh, you're asking me? Do you know that Ronnie, Phil Heath? Did Ronnie you? Coleman's is like a third of the size of mine. Bro, have you ever seen Phil's 50th anniversary? Uh-uh. It's all gold. Really? Yeah. It's the Dang. baddest ass. See, Phil has three different sandals. He has the old version that Ronnie has. Yeah. This he has one. the new version that you have. And then, and the then he has the golden 50th anniversary. Dang. Golden version. Next year, 60. 60. 60. So, but no, this one, like literally I had some people like try to hold it with two hands. They're like, holy crap. And they're like, you literally held that with one hand and like pose. I'm like, bro, I was in front of the entire world. I had one shot and I was, I was going to make it happen. I couldn't. Yeah. Couldn't. You, you, the old one that Ronnie has is a lot lighter. It's literally at least 50 to 60 pounds minimum. Yeah, because the case is this big now. Yeah. Case with the wheels and yeah. the carry on thing. It could be. It's 70. pretty badass. The new ones. The new ones yeah. definitely way better because of the. I love it, dude. It's awesome. Oh, of course you love it. <laughs> it's a, I I it's literally a Super Bowl trophy. It's been sitting on my kitchen table all week, dude. and I'm just I literally am just like you better put some lasers it. around it. I'm just staring at oh, it. Oh, here we go. What is Phil saying here? Phil says on the plane now, heading from Atlanta to Tech uh, to Texas. Cool. So he had, he had to do a layover. There was some flooding in Florida, he said. Mm. Really, like, nonstop raining. Dang. So it jammed him up coming out of... Uh, well, he's down south. Fort Lauderdale. Okay. Hopefully not wrong. Ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> Is this how he started? <laughs> not yet. Okay. We, we, we got that talk. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> no, no, no. We got we to gotta go to the official... The count. It's the final countdown. You know it, it's those now? samples of pre-workout he just Dude, did. I need some more. No, you don't. Yes, I do. You know what happened yesterday. But he that took was, too much. Dude, I took like a shit ton of brain builder and I turned Hold on. Down. We are at a perfect level right now. Let's no, keep no, it no, I here. need a little more. No, 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 no. Yes. <laughs> yes. Tell them bring in the floating fat man. <laughs> or oh, is that Dune? <laughs> <laughs> Give it, bring in the product development team. Sneak him some 3D instead of the extreme. Just, just tell him 3D would be good too because I get nootropics. Out yeah, see, okay, yeah, you don't yeah. need to tell, 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 tell him, tell him to bring something. Yeah, tell seriously, tell him to just 3D. No more than 3D. Yeah, it was just some little lipo extreme. <laughs> Like, I don't have a no. fucking problem. Who are you talking about? I don't have a problem. You have a problem. Oh, someone's FaceTiming. Me. Oh, we've been on this mistake. podcast five hours. I see pancakes. Whoa. Yep. That's definitely. Is that my wife? I knew it. That's why she didn't answer your call. Is that why you didn't answer my FaceTime? Are you at IHOP? <laughs> oh, my God. That looks amazing. Let's take a look at it again. Are you at IHOP or where are you at? Oh, that's the devastation. Oh my gosh. The other the utter devastation of it all. Your wife Where's is she going at? ham, bro. Ask her. Where are you at? Kiki. Kiki's. Oh, that place Kiki. is fire. Do you love me? Oh God, here we go. She says she's sweating. <laughs> <laughs> that's what normally what he says after he eats. <laughs> it's those carb sweats. That's right. It's time to bulk up that baby. I know. So the manager actually dropped off more, more pancakes because she said we were having too much fun. Oh, that's awesome. Who are you with? Uh, my friend Lauren and Kelsey. Say hi, guys. Hi, guys. Hey, t tell, tell the waitress I'll be home later. Get, you know, I needed to go order. Yeah? Those pancakes are looking fire. Yeah, yeah. Minus the pancakes, only the little strawberries <laughs> on the side. Okay. <laughs> That's it. I'll bring this one. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Hey, did you guys get the package yesterday or did it show up yet? It hasn't shown up yet. Okay, well, let us know. I'll go look at the tracking. Yeah. I'm excited. You should be. Thank you. You're welcome. Let us know when you get it. And we're going to jump on this podcast right now, Joe. And uh, okay. enjoy your pancakes. Love you. <laughs> Have fun. What's that? It was good seeing you, honey. It was good seeing you too. You guys have a good time. Enjoy your pancakes. Get 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 carb drunk. Yeah, he's he's drunk off uh, EVP Extreme right now. So <laughs> I know we're doing product sample and testing, and it's like. <laughs> 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 oh my gosh! Okay, have fun. Love you, babe. Love you. Bye. Take care, guys. Bye.
Bye bye. Oh my gosh. <laughs> hey, I don't blame her. Those pancakes look fire. They did. She was <laughs> like, dude, all it was is this apocalyptic mess of just chocolate. <laughs> and she's like, these used to be pancakes. <laughs> yeah. And it's just a, a plate of what used to be pancakes. That's right. That's right. Bring in the samples. More samples. <laughs> I want to party with him sometime. That's it, dude. <laughs> That's it. Yay. Another round. Bring in another round. Shots, shots, <laughs> shots, shots. That's uh, it. I, oh, between that. And I hope this is non-stem, seriously. Oh, no, no. You need to go. To, need, <laughs> there's always more, one more level. One, like I said, there's always one more. <laughs> and one. then you do this. No, no, that takes a lot. I would have to go through about three more sit. Dude, I went through a lot of caffeine yesterday. I know. You my did. jaw finally released. I know. I'm starting to feel it myself. <laughs> my jaw hurt. I took a half a scoop before you got in here, too. Did you? Of the coffee. Extreme yeah, because I, I wasn't expecting the sample. I was just, I thought we were getting on the podcast. So I took Oh, it. we were, but I took then a half said, a scoop. We have samples. I know. And they said, bring in the samples. Here we go. Yeah, but we still got to show you the movie Gladiator. I know. I still can't believe you haven't watched the movie. A three Gladiator. hour movie? I don't know, two and a half, three hours? How long is it? It's pretty long. Like two and a half, three. Two and a half, three. I can't even last 30 minutes. Here, let's ask, let's ask Siri. Siri, how long is the movie Gladiator? Two hours and 35 minutes. I could do the 35 minutes. You'll, do you do 15 minutes because <laughs> yeah. then you'll fall asleep. I actually I heard I, you snoring last night. I was telling night. Fairness. I heard you snoring last night. Did you? Yeah. I probably did. Yeah. I was telling Fairness, I was like, I literally picked movies to fall asleep to. <laughs> like, like what? Like I'll just pick a movie. I'm like, this would be a good one to fall asleep in the next ten minutes. <laughs> Unreal. <laughs> <laughs> Ask my wife. Should have asked her while she was on the phone. Okay, we're supposed to be doing a Q and A. Are we starting this? You haven't started recording, did you? Yeah, I already started, but I always start so that way I don't miss anything. Okay, well, it is what it is. Whatever. It's, it is what it is. We got a little Jelson in there. <laughs> we got a little bit of. Uh, who knows, who knows what we got in there, to be honest, Yeah, when, when it started, but we're here now. <laughs> yep, we are here now. So guys, welcome to Truth Podcast. I'm your host, Hani Rambot, and I'm here with 2023 Mr. Olympia, Derek Lunsford. How are you feeling? Uh, high energy. Yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> and it, I don't know what part of this we started recording at, but we have been testing some new flavors of the new, uh, the latest EVP Extreme NO we got some new flavors that are working on. And so therefore, between a little bit of 3D and this, these extreme flavors, um, I just told them to keep bringing them in. <laughs> and we're kind of kind of keeping it high and loose today. Yeah. So yeah. we're having some fun. Yeah. Derek's been here for a couple of days. And what we're doing is uh, just kind of reassessing uh, the Olympia, getting a chance to catch up, to talk about it. Obviously, it was a whirlwind this year. First and second place have been flip-flopped between Hottie and yourself. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about that. We're going to talk a little bit about this Q&A that you put up on your uh, Instagram that we have a bunch of questions on. And uh, and I just got back, too, because I was with Hadi during the weekend for Farina's is a Nutrition Palace event. And I uh, want to shout out to all of the amazing supporters of Hadi, myself, Evagen, Nutrition Palace. We had people, bro. I don't know if you saw the video. No, I did see it. It, it was, was crazy. It was pr crazy packed. People flew in from New York, New Jersey for a store appearance. Mm -hmm. I couldn't believe it. That was great. Believe. Great turnout. I mean, I've been there before, too, a couple yeah. of times. So. Nutrition Palace. This is Derek. <laughs> That's right. Asking us about their vegan, vegan options. options. <laughs> <laughs> that was funny. Yeah, that was great. Yeah. We got to come back and do yeah. <laughs> another one. Yeah, well, I look forward to it. Coming back out there to California and seeing everybody. It's been a couple of years now because yeah. you moved out here. But uh, no, last weekend I was up in New York, New yep. Jersey. Yeah, let's talk about that. How did uh, how did the event go? How was Big Steve? How's Donna? They're amazing. Yeah, super great people. I mean, constantly like asking me, "Is there anything I can get for you? Do you need anything? Are you good?" I'm like, "I'm I'm solid." And at one point, I started thinking to myself, maybe I should like find something to that I need, <laughs> like because they just kept asking, asking. Like, uh, they're just super hospital, super nice people. And, you know, we went out to dinner every night, and um, which was nice. But as far as the event, um, packed house. Steve said it's, you know, hasn't been like this since before 2020. And, um, I mean, there was literally only standing room left. And uh, I was literally standing. Now, what city was it in? Uh, it was in New Jersey. I forget what city. Where would you fly into? JFK. Okay. Yeah. So Because no, you were able to go, and I 
thought you were gonna you you trained for a couple of days over at Bev's, right? Yeah, yeah. So I just put up a, a YouTube video of my back workout okay. that I did when I first flew in on that Thursday, and then Friday I did a a chest workout. So we're gonna put that YouTube video up too. Did you train with anybody, or was it just by yourself? No, just me and Trevor went up there. Uh, my wife stayed at home, uh, just you know, because she's super pregnant. Uh, so she stayed at home. Just me and Trevor went up there. Steve wanted to train with me, but he had just had surgery. So mm -hmm. he was recovering. Um, so maybe next time I'll go train with him. But no, I got to see some familiar faces that I knew from up in New York. Uh, and then I got to meet a ton of, of new people, which was when was the last time you were up in New York? Um, I think it might've been about a year ago. Uh, no, it was at least two years ago. Oh, wow. So it's been a while. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they have a bunch of brand new pieces of equipment at the gym which was really nice. A lot of stuff that I don't get to use at home. Mm -hmm. So it was really cool that I got to go there and, and, and test out those pieces. You know, one thing about Steve is, which is really cool, is you'd think with such an established gym mm -hmm. that he would be fine with it because right. it was always a really, really great gym. And you're looking at it going, just when you make sure you follow Steve on Instagram. Yeah. Bev's Gym uh, is the Instagram page. Because... He gets new stuff all the time. And then what he does is he finds out that like, hey, look, I have some a better alternative and then he'll move it. Mm -hmm. And that's why, you know, it's passionate, right? It's like us when we try to come up with flavors and products and, and trying to find, when you have somebody who has passion, they're never complacent. And he's always trying to make the gym better, always. Right. And I was, because I was just up there with Sebum not a long time ago. Uh, I think it was like, I don't know, like three months ago. And, um, and I saw a bunch of new equipment. And I'm going, Steve, where'd you put this? And he goes, no, man, some of the stuff, the older stuff that wasn't being used or was not as good, I'm, I got rid of that. I brought some stuff in. And then sometimes some of the new stuff, he goes, yep, that was a piece of shit. I didn't like it. I moved it out. <laughs> yeah. And that's just how he, you know, he just uses feedback. He uses it himself. He gets feedback from the trainers, from the other uh, the members, whoever it is. And then he's always trying to make that gym better. And that's what's really cool about somebody who has so much passion like Big Steve, because he's always trying to make that gym better. Yeah. I mean, it was great the last time I went there, but it's absolutely number one gym in New York. No question. It's the number one. It's one of the number one yeah. gyms in the world because yeah. of the atmosphere. When you go into a place, yes. it's not just the equipment, it's the atmosphere. And what happens is you go in there and you're just instantly motivated. You walk in and uh, for those that have never been to Steve's gym, what's cool is you see all of the pictures of him and Dorian and the pictures and the videos I'm sorry, the um, the magazine mm -hmm. articles that have been yep. encapsulated up on the walls, what they do is they take all of those headlines and they take some of the car articles and then they they kind of superimpose them on these hard um, backing, really nice frames. Mm -hmm. And you can see from 15, 20, 25, I mean, 30 years ago. And then you have you know a ton of really cool images of Bev. And then you have just all of the relationships from the IFBB Pro League, the NPC, um, just all the champions, amazing old pictures of Jay. It's iconic. Yeah, like super. so much, so much bodybuilding history and and not just that, but just like like you know, wrestling history and and, and celebrities and actors, actresses that came through there. Yep. It's just really, really cool. If you're if you're a fan of bodybuilding, like that's one place that you need to go. It's like a, it's like Disneyland for bodybuilding fans. Yeah, I tell everybody right. if you want to go and kind of get a vibe, go to LA and mm -hmm. go to Gold's Venice. If you want to go and get an amazing training session and you really want to be motivated to be able to be the best version of yourself, make the pilgrimage to the East Coast Mecca because that's Bev's uh, gym. It's, um, and then from time to time, Bev will be there. And I spent a long time, uh, a lot of time there myself because as you know, I used to train Kevin English yep. and Kevin still works for Steve. Mm -hmm. And so um, I believe he's still working the morning shifts. And he would be in there at like, oh, dark hundred yeah. and go in there and work, then train. So he was telling me, Steve told me that Steve and Donna, they, they're flying out to um, somewhere halfway around the world. Mm -hmm. And they're literally flying back for 12 hours just to be at the gym for that short window of time and then turn around and go back to wherever the next place is just so that he could come back to be at the gym. Like... Anytime, I mean, as much as he travels, imagine you probably want to come home and relax, take it easy. But mm, not Steve. Nope, he wants to be in that gym. No, Steve. Yeah. Steve's a whole different. He's cut from a different cloth, man. Yeah. The guy is just he's a grinder, grinder, grinder. And what um, what I was wanting to build on was that when Kevin was there, 
like I said, he still is, but when he was competing, mm -hmm. 202 was him versus Flex, mm -hmm. and these guys were used to go at it, and I was coaching him. It was so imperative that he really brought in his all-time best because he always wanted to make Steve proud because he represented the gym, he represented, represented Big Steve. He was always, it was just, it, it's like a New York thing. Mm -hmm. It was such a thing because, not, not just because of the fact that he trains there, but because he also worked there, it was so important for him to just be like, man, I got to take my body to that next level. And so even when he was on low carbs and he was eating a fish and rice and, and just killing himself, it was one of those things that it was like such a great community because everybody that trained there was always like, come on, Kevin, you got this, man. Come on, Kevin. Yep. And, um, and again, Juan Morrell, all those guys that, mm -hmm. you know, we got a ton of legends that came out of that gym. Yeah. And then whenever Dorian was in town, you know, he'd be out there staying with Big Steve. He'd always be uh, training at Bev's. And uh, it was kind of like that was his home base in the U.S. Yeah. going over to Bev's. So that was always good to see all of those iconic pictures. So if you haven't made it out there, definitely make it out there. And if you're getting ready for a show, I always recommend this. And I've said this many, many years ago, but I probably haven't said it in a while. One of the things that I used to do when I was getting ready for shows is I would drive from Santa Barbara, where I was going to school, mm -hmm. to Gold's Venice, and I would see... Flex Wheeler, Chris Cormier, Rico, all of those guys turn around and they were all training. And when you're training 30 feet, 20 feet away from those guys, it creates this essence of like, hey man, there's greatness in the room and it makes you elevate your game. And it's not just that day, but it motivates you for the next couple of months right. going into the show. So I always, always recommend it. In the Midwest, go to Dylan Armbrist's gym. Mm -hmm. You know, you can come out here to Dallas. There's a couple of gyms. There's Destination. There's, um, there's, you know, the West Coast going out to uh, Gold's Venice was a big one. Believe it or not, Gold San Jose for a long time was a, was a really good one as well, especially the older one that was really, really big that I met Chris Cook at. And there was a bunch of met Jay Cutler there 25 yeah. years ago when he did an appearance there. That's when him and I first met. And uh, it was one of those things that going to those gyms are so important. And I think MI40 kind of is a little well, bit Well, I was like about that. to touch on that. If down south, you know, obviously I moved from Indiana to Florida to train at MI40. Okay. And then I just love the surrounding area of Tampa, Clearwater, St. Pete. So, you know, I, you know, built my, my foundation there. And um, hopefully uh, this coming year, we'll, we'll be able to make and build our own gym and, um, that's kind of why I want to go around, you know, checking out your gym, checking out mm -hmm. all these other gyms is to, to hand select the best pieces of equipment to put in my gym for me to, to come back and, and continue to improve and me be my best. So um, hopefully I'll, I'll be able to set something up in Clearwater this year. Sure. Yeah, yeah. that's a great yeah. idea because not only will it give you the opportunity to have some place to train. Right. But then you can also create so can, something because there's really nothing besides MI40. I mean, I'm sure there's a couple of yeah, other, there's really other good gyms. Yeah, there's other good gyms too, but MI40 is kind of like the more known bodybuilding gym. Mm -hmm. And it's also semi private, which is what mine. How big is that gym? How many square feet is that gym? It's like 10,000 square feet. Okay. Yeah. It's good size. Mine will be a little bit bigger than that. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I want the same thing. Like, I want to have the best equipment uh, for me to train with. Mm -hmm. But also, like you just said, the atmosphere is so important. So it's not going to be a public gym. It's going to be like a semi-private gym mm -hmm. where we'll have people that are there, but people that are serious and, and, and want to, you know, have a positive, uh, share a positive vibe and have passion for training and training hard and wanting to really elevate themselves and elevate each other. So like that's, that's very deep rooted in me is to build camaraderie, build community. And, um, so to create a good community uh, at my own gym. You in know, your own backyard. Yeah, in like yeah. 15, 20 minutes from my house. Yeah, well, and, and, and the other one that I, I forgot to mention, which is one of the most iconic gyms in the country, is obviously Metroflex. Yeah. Metro, Metroflex, the original Arlington one mm -hmm. where I've trained with Ronnie before. I used to train Ronnie's girlfriend at the time there, Alti. We'd go in there and train. She, she was always, uh, you know, heart, you know, person who loved to train. But... Ronnie, who, when you watch the iconic videos, if you look at it, I mean, people used to call it like a prison gym, right? Yeah. Like, you know, bent yeah. dumbbells, you know, you're doing walking lunges outside in 100 degrees with 100% humidity. Crazy things like that, but it's just what you did, right? Right. And I feel that those are the gyms that build character. Mm -hmm. Those are the types of gyms that build character. And I feel like when you go into those types of the gyms, it, it's, it's different level. Nowadays, there's now a lot of gyms that are popping up. 
that are much more influencer gyms, right? And there's nothing wrong with influencer gyms, but it is different than when somebody who's trying to get ready for a Mr. Olympia versus yes. somebody else who's just trying to get content yes. for their TikTok and Instagram channels. Right. So there is a different, again, nothing wrong with those, but they're just different. Yeah. And so I feel that when you're getting ready for a bodybuilding show, you should go to a harder core gym mm-hmm. at some point during your prep or multi-time, you know, right. I, I would go every three to four weeks yeah. because again, for me, it was only an hour and a half, two hour drive from Santa Barbara to Venice. And I love to go down there because then I can go use the posing room. I would see, get motivated, see everybody that's just elite Olympia level while I was doing the Ironman naturally. And for me, that was the proverbial like, okay, let's go. Let's make sure that we're doing everything we possibly can so that I can be able to be the best version of myself. And um, it was fun. I see Charles Glass. He'd be like, hey, what's up, man? And I'd be like, what's <laughs> hey, up? Yeah. You know? <laughs> and I'm like 152 pounds. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Going swole. Yeah. Jack. 152 pounds. Yeah. Um, but I'm like, yeah, man, I'm going to suck it down to 148, 149. <laughs> but, um, but it was a really good time. And uh, so, again, yeah. it was a great guest posing. I saw the videos. Yeah. Still in That's amazing fun. shape. Saw you pose here just yesterday mm-hmm. when we ended up uh, training chest. Mm-hmm. Still round and full. But also, you've stayed in condition. What do you weigh right now? Uh, I haven't weighed myself in a couple days, but uh, before I came out here, I was like uh, only about 12 pounds up from stage weight. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Uh, so you've held it really, really well together. I would say 12 to 15 pounds, you know, stage weight. Yeah, and again, for those that are listening, you got an Olympia winner here who hasn't gained 40 pounds. Mm -hmm. Those things... I preach, I preach, I preach to you all who are listening to this, whether you're getting ready for a photo shoot or whether you're a bikini competitor or whether you're a figure competitor or whether you're an open bodybuilder, the fluctuations of weight gain right after a show are detrimental to your organs. You have to keep it together. You have to really control it. So you have a guy who just is sitting across from me who just won the Olympia two weeks ago and he's only gained about 10, 12 pounds. Mm -hmm. And why? Because hard on your blood pressure. It's just absolutely devastating to your physique when your gut gets blown out and you're gaining 20, 30 pounds. So keeping all of those things together are going to help you improve long term. And you're not going to have that long term damage that could be caused by high blood pressure from going low sodium, low carbohydrates, tons of cardio to high sodium, no cardio, and just, you know, eating high amounts of fat because you're going from one extreme to another, it wreaks havoc on your body and you are going to literally cause long-term damage. And lots of people don't check their blood pressure, it's called the silent killer for a reason, and you end up having all kinds of health and medical problems because of what you just did after the show. So that's exactly how everybody should be thinking, but I can tell you for my own self, Mm -hmm. you know, take take myself back to when I first started bodybuilding before I met you. You could have told me that, but I'm like, oh, I'm young, I'm healthy, I'm good. I just dieted for six months and I wanna go eat all this stuff. I can tell you that from my experience, and and I do think that way now, I do think long-term, but I think there's a lot of people that don't think Mm long-term. Like, yeah, yeah, that's great, but you know, we'll cross that bridge when I get there. You know, for me, my mindset used to be, like I said, just got done competing, Uh, I'm ravenous, I wanna go have all the foods that I couldn't have during my prep. Now that I'm at more of an elite level, I've done this for several years, my mindset is just like what you said, long-term health, but also the short-term satisfaction of not, like you said, not blowing out your Mm -hmm. physique, but I, I wanna feel healthy. When you're going out and you're eating high sodium, high caloric, crazy, you know, meals right after a show, you know, and you're gaining all that weight and that water retention, you're just going to feel like garbage. You do. And let's be honest, you're going to continue to be hungry afterwards. Like your body's ramped up, your metabolism's ramped up. It doesn't really matter how much you eat. You're just going to continue to want to eat and eat and eat and eat and eat. So if you can just continue to um, moderate your food, like just eat in moderation and and do your best to, to continue eating the same foods that you have been for the last several weeks. Like for example, like if Instead of eating, uh, you know, something something crazy uh, after a show, I might have the same salmon and rice that I would have had previous mm-hmm. to coming into the Olympia, but I might just have a little bit more. I might have a couple more ounces of the salmon or a little bit more of the rice. Um, and for a little bit of sauce. Yeah, maybe a little bit of sauce. But it's like you take the same foods, the clean foods that you have been eating, and you just add a little bit more to it. 
Right. That's and, and I think that's for me that's worked out the best because I feel good. I'm fueled up. Um, you know, like I said, you're still going to be hungry, but you're getting a, a little bit more satisfaction than um, you know sticking to this low calorie diet. But also like like the the blandness of it too. Yeah. So you're you're not going from the, these crazy swings of eating super low food to now you're eating these crazy cheat meals. And then that's what I what I was saying was you just doing that, you'll feel like garbage and then you're still going to be hungry. So it just kind of compounds on itself. Um, and it's hard to really control once you let yourself go like that. One thing I was super impressed with is the fact that when you guys came in, mm -hmm. we went to my house and Megafit was there. Yeah. And so this is where the situation of having meal prep helps so much. And I saw you eating two meals at a time, you know, <laughs> yeah. which is still okay because you're at about five, six hundred calories per meal. Yeah. So you're hitting about a thousand calories. But again, it's good, clean calories. And having that instead of saying, hey, man, I'm going to go to Cheesecake Factory or I'm going to go out to here or I'm going to mm -hmm. go through a drive through. And I don't even know what you ate, but I just saw the, the empty because you were just, yeah. I mean, dude, I, and I'll be honest with you, I have never seen anybody eat like you do. <laughs> like everybody has issues with eating that I've ever worked with. I know mm -hmm. Jay did, Phil did, and some of them have just issues with just eating, but there's others who literally, it's very, very difficult to the point where they want to take peptides, they want to do crazy things, mm -hmm. they want to smoke weed, which again, I'm a huge, uh, I, I just, I hate, I hate weed and for many reasons. I think it makes you lazy. We can, we'll talk about that too on this podcast because I think it's good because we, sure. that, that's a natural segue to a conversation we used to have a couple yep. of years ago mm -hmm. because of the situation you were, you were doing with, with mm -hmm. your vape pens. But they'll, they'll try to trick their body in any way they can. But one thing is you naturally have a crazy appetite, dude. Always have. And it's Always. just like, it's like you have the caveman gene, bro. <laughs> you do. You do. I, might, I, maybe. I know there's probably a couple of people I can't remember who I've worked with that can eat but no one like you. Yeah. You are an eating fucking machine. <laughs> yeah, I never <laughs> never had a problem with uh, eating or gaining muscle. So those two things kind of well, go Well, I think they hand. go hand in hand, Yeah, right? I, I, and people go, oh, I, you know, I'm not gaining muscle. And I go, well, do you eat? And you're like, no, I'm not that yeah. hungry. Sometimes I, I think back to it, and maybe I became a bodybuilder because I like to eat. <laughs> Was it a problem when you used to have to cut weight for wrestling? I cut a lot of weight for wrestling. So I wonder about that too. I think maybe restricting my my body from um you know getting the nutrients that it needed for like wrestling back in in mm -hmm. high school like so cutting weight for wrestling in high school i wonder if that really you know uh catapulted me to where i started you know after cutting the weight i started eating more and it and it just kind of like uh i rebounded mm -hmm. you know similar to like a bodybuilding show do you think it's stunt your growth i don't know i mean i'm not that sure your your parents are sure. like six three <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, I'm because you know they say there's certain types of dieting that can stunt growth, and there's also heavy, heavy training yeah. can stunt growth. Again, usually it has to be pretty extreme. But I don't know how crazy your weight cuts were. Did you cut down to like 112s or 118s? My or? high school wrestling coach, um, he actually told me like he he had um, been a coach for like nearly 30 years, uh -huh. and he said, Derek, I've never seen someone cut weight like you ever. Um, How you, much did you cut? Uh, my freshman year of high school, I wrestled 112, 112 pounds. I was totally kidding. Really? You went down to 112? Yeah. And I actually had to have my parents sign a, a waiver to allow me to get down to 112.0 because if I weighed 111.9, I was under the weight that I was allowed to by like the health regulation. For your height? Uh, just for whatever reason, the way you would have to weigh in early in the season, uh -huh. like, like before the season started, you would have to weigh in and okay. like send that to the, um, to the state, I guess. Yeah. The state or something. Uh, and then that would allow you to like compete in whatever weight class, but they wouldn't allow you to, to drop any more than a certain amount of weight. Wow. So I had to have my, I don't, they didn't have any of that shit when I was, yeah. when I was wrestling, really? there was no early like <clears throat> season weigh-ins. It was just, you could cut 50 pounds. They wouldn't care. Yeah. Um, so my parents had to sign a waiver to allow me to get to a 112.0. So 111.9 was your cutoff. Was, if I weighed 111.9, then they wouldn't allow me cause it would, would have been a health risk. But if I was 112.1, .1, I was over the weight. So there was, I had to weigh 112.0, which means I had to really dial in 
uh, my weight and, and, and everything right to the very minute I stepped on that scale. And that was the beginning of, of and what was your off season versus <clears throat> your cut to make that 112? How much were you getting up to? So I think preseason, maybe I was like in like a 140. So it doesn't sound like a lot, but imagine you're like a, a fresh like were you about the same height? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Um, a year height. That's a lot. That's really low weight. One twelve. Mm -hmm. And then the next year, I, I wrestled one nineteen. And then the next year, or sorry, one twenty five. And I wrestled one twenty five for two years. And then I wrestled one thirty my uh, senior year of high school. And I cut from like one sixty to one thirty. And so, like being a high schooler, that's kind of a lot. Like you hear the UFC, these guys they do it like all the time. Right. They cut thirty pounds. Um, but as a high school kid, you know, like that's that's really not. That's rare. That's not you know, typical at all. I, I was, I w I'll be honest, like this is not to sound like a tough guy or toot my own horn, but I was very, very disciplined at a very early age when it came to my sports and uh -huh. athletics and, and like discipline with like the nutrition and cutting weight and stuff like that. So I just, I, I know my wrestling partner, he was like, would say like, you know, in wrestling, you don't miss weight. Like that's just, that that's, um, like a character flaw if you basically if you miss weight do you feel like you that was because of the coaches you had or was that because of your upbringing from your family not my family no that was my family's push the family motivation would have been like like i want to prove to them that i that i am disciplined that i do work hard that i am somebody basically like you know i was trying to make something of myself um that was where that push came from for my family uh maybe my friends too uh but as far as like coaches Coaches, I think, just wanted to bring the best out of me. I think it was more of like my peers, like my wrestling partners, like um, you know, my my training partner and stuff. Mm -hmm. They were the ones that were, you know, like, you know, if you don't do this, basically, like, how do I say this uh, politically correct? <laughs> um, basically, you're a wimp if you don't if you don't uh, follow through, right? I, now, don't be a bitch. There you go. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So um, missing weight was just never really an option. And you for did me. pretty well in wrestling, and, right? Yeah. And, and just giving my best each and every day, that's where it all started was with, within wrestling and stuff. And I took it very, very seriously. But yeah, I mean, in the beginning, when I was in freshman, sophomore year, I was getting my butt whooped a little bit. Or pretty good, I should say. And then as the years went on, you know, I, I, I trained year round. I mean, I went to every wrestling camp I could. I did every tournament that I possibly could. I was training every single day like I was an Olympian in high school. Even though I wasn't very good, I was training around the clock, uh, given absolutely everything I possibly could. So by the time I was a senior of high school, then I started having colleges, you know, recruit me. And so I picked a certain college or university. Uh, it was a small NAIA school in Tennessee. And uh, I went there, <clears throat> thought it was right for me, and I realized in that time, wrestling is not going to be my future. Uh, there's, uh, I need to, I need to figure it out what it is that I'm being called to do, but it's not wrestling anymore. So and, you took off early. Yeah. So I only wrestled there for a short period of time, and then transferred schools that didn't have wrestling. And uh, shortly after that, that's when I found bodybuilding because I still have that competitive spirit. Did you train like a bodybuilder when you were in high school? Yeah, so that was the thing. I didn't understand uh, how to train sport specific, right? I just went in the gym and I just crushed it every day. So like that's another thing too. Like when me and you got together, I'd really never had any guidance in terms of like the training. I would mm -hmm. just, I would just follow what I saw online. I'd watch like the Jay Cutlers, the Phil Heath, whoever. Um, I, I would watch their YouTube videos. Obviously, I'd watch some of yours too. But I never really had any direct guidance in terms of. Um, how to train like a bodybuilder, nor did I have much guidance in how to train mm -hmm. in the gym for wrestling. I, well, until I got to college, I, I suppose. What's up, guys? The Black Friday sale is now live, up to 60% off at evagennutrition.com. Plus, you get amazing swag items at different tiers. And for those of you that are listening to this, you get an extra 10% off on top of those amazing deals if you use the code HANI. Use code H-A-N-Y for the additional 10% off Check it out, evagenutrition.com. No, you're, I think you're just ready for more shots. No, right? dude, they're bringing me stuff because I'm just like, man, just keep them coming because <laughs> I want I want you to get a chance to try some of the new stuff too. Yeah. 
But I think that the biggest thing that I realized when I started working with you is that I'm like, wow, he really doesn't have a lot of formal training. Yeah. And it wasn't a knock. It was just something that was kind of eye opening for me. I was like, wait a minute. You didn't have anybody walk you through this, this and this. And you're like, not really. I mean, I, I know enough to, Mm -hmm. you know, what you watched on YouTube or what you read in the magazines or or Mm -hmm. whatnot. But it was, it was pretty, um, bodybuilding light, you know, basically my foundation was discipline and work ethic and sacrifice. Yeah. And I can tell because it was sometimes so frustrating because I'm like, how did you get this far? I just worked my butt off. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) And, and again, for those that don't know the story, Derek and I first met unbeknownst to me in 2016, right? Yeah. 2016. 2016. 2016. Evagen booth, right? Evagen booth, Arnold (laughs) classic, I was there with the Evagen athletes. I was there with, um, you know, Nick and the boys from from the office, and we were there. And then, you know, little old Derek Linsford. I'm with up. I'm with Jelson, yeah, my it, wife. It, it, and I'm like, hold on, that's Honey Rambod. And she's like, who? <laughs> and I'm like, that's Honey Rambod. Okay, I go, I gotta go say something to him. Hold on, just stay right here. I gotta say something. She's like, okay. So I, I ran up to you. You were by yourself. You were mixing up something. Actually, I don't know. Was I? Yeah, probably like EVP Extreme or something. So, I don't know. You're mixing up something. And uh, I said, hey, hey, honey. And you're like, oh, hey, how you doing? And I was like, hey, uh, <clears throat> can you make me the next Phil Heath? And you were like. And I laughed. Ha, ha, You started <laughs> laughing. I was like, uh, okay, yeah, have a nice day. <laughs> I was like in this, um, I was in this fanboy moment. Uh-huh. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> and uh, I was like, well, all right, I said it. And this is my motivation because one day. We're gonna have a serious conversation about working together. Like that was that was why I wanted to come up, come up and say that to you is because, you know, my dream was always to be at the Olympia level, to be Mr. Olympia, and um, I don't know. I just felt like I knew you were gonna laugh because why wouldn't you? Yeah, but you gotta remember, <laughs> the reason why I laughed is because guys that look like you, yeah, normally want to be the next Jake Hutler, the J, <laughs> the J. <laughs> and I'm like, he's a wide guy, yeah, okay. And uh, I mean, Phil is light skin, but yeah. again, he's <laughs> bubbly. He's a little bit more narrow, but super 3D. And you were small back then, yeah. right? What'd you weigh? Oh man, I was 2016. Uh, I competed just under 180 pounds. Yeah, so you're 180 pounds. And, but like I said, but you're still wide. Mm-hmm. You know, you have wide clavicles and everything else. And I'm like laughing because I'm like, most guys yeah. that look like you want to look like Jay. <laughs> I think I was four weeks out at that time and... Um, we drove in the middle of the night from Indiana to, to Ohio. Oh, what show were you doing then? Uh, it was the um, it was called the Midwest Battle of Champions. That was uh-huh. the first year that they had it in Indiana. Uh, Dave Bowers was the promoter, the one that did the Indie Pro. So it was the it was the year before the Indie Pro started. Uh-huh. It, it uh, the amateur show that that was with it. Mm-hmm. Um, I did that show. I was the first person to to do that show and win the overall. So. But no, that's an interesting story, you know? Yeah, you know, it's it's also what's really cool about it is that now I can reference that story Thank when you. people go, someday I want to work with you. And I go, that, be careful what you wish for mm-hmm. because that's exactly what Derek did. Yeah, and, and I think it goes to show like you need to show up to these events. If, you, if you're really a bodybuilding fan, you really want to, um, you know, get out there, I think you need to... to you know, show up to these events. I was, I would show up to just the most random NPC show on a weekend. Uh, I would go to any expo that I could and I did it because I loved it. And I, I always wanted to be involved more in the industry. And so what's really cool about bodybuilding is that it's not like the NBA or NFL or anything else where, you know, you see, you know, your favorite coaches or your favorite athletes or whatever, and, and you're never going to be able to talk to them with us. Very like, accessible. Yeah, we're right there at the booth. Right. You can ask us anything. Yeah. And we're, you know, you literally, I, I spend a, way too much time probably talking. I have a crazy, crazy line and, and I'm spending 10 minutes talking to the same person. But I like that. Like, right. I want to have a genuine conversation because I remember what it was like when I met my favorite bodybuilders back in 2015, 2016. Who are your favorite bodybuilders? Um, of course, the Jay Kettlers, the Phil Heaths. <laughs> but I'll tell you what, um, you mentioned them earlier. And I just saw him over the weekend, but one Morel had a great impact on me. Yeah. I met him. He's a good dude. He is a very good guy. I remember 
the impact he had on me at the Arnold Classic in 2015. And he's a car guy, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So he'll like, I get to see They have a nice Rolls content. Royce. Yeah, not that car. <laughs> I mean, not nothing against Rolls Royce, but yeah. but he's he's into 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 fast shit, and I'm into fast shit. So yeah, it's like that. But no, great him and Karen, both great people. Uh, happy for their success with my cookie dealer and everything. Uh -huh. But anyhow, um, I remember uh, I just went up to him and I said, "Hey, man, can I get a picture?" And I just thought he was just gonna kind of like, yeah, man, here, okay, real quick, you know, that's just what I was expecting, and it wasn't. It was like, hey, yeah, man, and then we had like this nice, genuine interaction, uh -huh. and. He gave me the time of day, and I thought, man, if I'm ever in that position to be an IFBB pro, be an Olympian, or God willing, be Mr. Olympia, that's how I want to be. I want to be mm. like that. I want to just be Derek and genuine and have nice, genuine conversations and personal interactions with people instead of just next, next, next. And I don't think there's too many people like that in our industry that's, that's you know, is that way. I think most people are very personable and very, you know, interact uh, a lot with their with their fans. But I just remember that he had a great impact on me in that moment. And from then on I said, if I'm ever at that at that level, that's that's how I want to be. No, that's good that's a good way to be and I think it's a great role model because a lot of people don't realize that when people come up and they want to take a photo with us. By the way, that's the strawberry lemonade that's by I wasn't going to interrupt you. I was like, man, this is delicious. <laughs> That's really. This is the strawberry lemonade. Yeah, this is the one that's gonna get, that's gonna drop in a couple of days. It tastes like. Uh, it does not taste like Crystal Light. That's what you would think it would taste like. Yeah, it tastes like legitimately you made lemonade. Mm -hmm. You crushed up strawberries and, and then like them. blended it together. That's right. Yeah, it's got a really really cool complex flavor system that I think came out really well. But um, anyway, yeah. But, but I was saying is that when you look at it in its entirety, that. The things that have changed, and because I've been around for so long now, mm -hmm. I've been around since you know the Dorian era, then the Ronnie Coleman era, and before there was social media. And then as the social media generation has evolved, you start seeing you know again. I think Phil, uh, who's actually going to be here in a couple hours, mm -hmm. um, it, it was in in a very very tough predicament because of the situation of him having to be the first social media Olympian you know, mm -hmm. Olympia champion. And you don't know how to even interact sometimes because he got that with a dose of Generation Iron and that right. was, you know, everybody knows how that story went. But I feel that nowadays people really gravitate to people that they can be able to really see as genuine. Mm -hmm. And you can only hold a front of being so, you know, nice <laughs> and cool and this or... It would or, be way too exhausting, especially being a bodybuilder. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I feel that you know, guys like um, how how you've really opened up the bandwidth with Trevor, showing a ton of videos. You guys had a video every single day getting ready for the Olympia. Mm -hmm. You know, having Trevor there, um, having you know, even Nick Walker does mm -hmm. a great job. And I feel like that that's what the future is really showing. I mean, Chris, right? Yeah. Even though Chris wasn't posting every day in regards to like videos, but the stuff that him and Calvin do is is very very epic because some of that stuff can be literally like almost like a one hour movie right right and i feel that that really draws in the attention of the viewer but it makes it so personal mm -hmm. and what i was saying was when people come up to you nowadays their hands are shaking yeah right because they're just so excited to see you yeah. and then it's like i sometimes put my hand on their shoulder and be like come down yeah bro. calm down yeah it's a calm down it's like you doing all right take a deep breath yeah <laughs> you know you good where are you from yeah, yeah you know oh i'm from cincinnati ohio or i'm from mm -hmm. you know so and so in new york and i'd be like you having a good time cool yeah. you know let's, let's talk a little bit to that him, was probably me back in 2016. <laughs> you know <laughs> <To> you. <laughs> yeah but you know i don't remember specifically but i remember uh, when you told me you were like yeah you know i told you yeah. you want to be with like, Phil Heath, and i laughed <laughs> and i go well, you know why i laugh because i would say that you yeah you, know, you look much more like, like jay, jay cutler <laughs> you got a little more of a skin tone of jay cutler than you do with <laughs> phil heath but um uh, which is funny and ironic now because yeah. some people are saying well his back is starting to look very phil heath-esque right which is an amazing compliment huge compliment yeah. but um but ultimately what's really cool is the fact that if you sit and you really appreciate the journey yeah and being able to do that i mean seabum talks about it mm -hmm. and he did it this year because he tore his lad at 10 weeks out and where he couldn't train for a month you went through it last year mm 
mm-hmm. with me having to come out and I almost pulled you out of the show two weeks out Yeah, last year. And your body, as much as we talk about your digestion mm-hmm. and we talked about like even off camera about how good it was and last year mm-hmm. because of your illness, you also got sick last year yeah. from the water park. Yep. And then that turned into a bacterial infection. Mm-hmm. Then they had to put you on antibiotics and it tore up your gut. And even the, we threw probiotics at it. We threw in a bunch of different things in it. And yeah. we eventually got your gut better. But mm-hmm. there was a time where you were like, honey, I have no appetite. Yeah, which is not me. Not you at all. Like me, I'm hungry all the time. <laughs> right. So you have adversity. Yeah. And it doesn't matter who you are, what kind of sport you're you're in or whether it's mm-hmm. i guess work related whether it's your personal there's always adversity yeah and there might be times of this calmness that you should enjoy and reflect and and pray that you hey look thank you god for giving me this mm-hmm. calmness but but i have to also be able to understand that there's going to be times where the seas are going to start getting a little bit rough yeah and it's how you deal with that mm-hmm. and i'm and again talking a little about phil heath winning seven olympia titles and him having you know, his father died in one of them. He's going through a divorce on one of them. His his wife at the time had cancer at one of them. Like, dude, the guy was going after, and it wasn't transparent to anybody yeah. because social media, you didn't share any of that shit. Mm-hmm. You just dealt with it. Right. You just dealt with it. Mm-hmm. And nowadays, people, I think, are more apt to show what's going on. Mm-hmm. You know, you see Nick Walker, he tore his hamstring, right? right? And it's like instantaneously within hours, pictures of his hamstring all blown up. Look absolutely just really really bad and i definitely think he could have been in the top three this year and i think you know prayers out to him for a fast recovery because i like nick i think that you know i I think the world of him because he's a super passionate guy bodybuilder but it's devastating bro yeah it's devastating i can only imagine like him mentally what he's going through he what he continues to go through but what he went through the week of the show Mm -hmm. but those things were not shown at the time right when all of those injuries happened to Phil. We didn't show him. Mm-hmm. We didn't. We didn't talk about him. He didn't talk about his dad and how much it affected him passing away during the prep, mm-hmm. because we didn't want people to think that. At the time, it's like you had to be stoic. Right. You had to be stoic. You yeah. had to be like, look, dude, I'm going to be this granite figure, that no one is going to see any weakness, mm-hmm. and I think that like guys like Sebum have shown, like, hey, look, dude, let me pull the, the curtains back. And let me show you a little bit of what I go through. The guy is like literally telling people how he is crying on the floor going, what am I going to do? And again, he had gone through some of those trials and tribulations in the prior years, but never with me because I've only been working with him for the last two preps. Mm-hmm. And so with me, it was a bit different because I'm like, okay, is this the, is, it, is he done? Is he done? You know, not being able to, tr- to do upper body. And all I thought about was like, okay, let's pray on this. Let's just see if he, how he is going to come back, yeah. if he's going to be able to start training again, or if he's going to have to pull out of the show. And I thought about you. I thought about last year. Um, and I just think about the whole situation, you know, and there's so much adversity. I mean, haughty with, you know, not having a passport, not being able to speak English. I mean, him having not money for bus fare when he was coming up. Yeah. He didn't have any of those things. And I think that's why bodybuilding teaches you so much discipline on how to win at life. Yes. And that's why everybody who's listening to this should do at least one show. Because when you do that, what it shows is that is how you grow up. That's how you create coping mechanisms. Because if you can do that at least once in your life, you're going to feel like you sacrificed all the other bullshit, going out at night, drinking with the, on the weekends, you know, putting away the food, you know, all of these things. I mean, religions like in Islam where they say, hey, look, no drinking, no, no, no food because they're fasting. I mean, I feel like it's spiritual, right? They try to get you closer to God. And I feel that in bodybuilding in certain ways there is, and some people are going to be like, well, what about the drugs or what about this? I'm talking about just when it comes to food alone. Yes. Don't pull into the fucking (laughs) drive-thru at McDonald's or wherever is, is, Tough enough for most of the population, but when you have to get up and do cardio in the morning and all these things, it's going to make you a better person. Yes. And you're speaking on just in terms of discipline. And I've always said bodybuilding is the epitome of discipline. Look, like I said earlier, I was a wrestler. I, I, I did many sports. I've done a lot of things in my life, but nothing compares to the discipline that it takes 
to be a bodybuilder. And so, you know, when I'm going around, it's like, for example, this past weekend, and I'm on stage, and I get the chance to speak, I like to tell people the same thing, like, you know, you should compete, right? And, and if you do, you should just give your 100% best effort, follow through, and let, of course, we want to win, but let the prep, let the process, let this lifestyle that you're living shape and mold you from within. Yeah, we're shaping our bodies. You want to become stronger, bigger, more sculpted. But but this is really about character building. And if you can build your character through the process of bodybuilding and the lifestyle of bodybuilding, then you're going to have great uh, a great outcome, not just in bodybuilding, but like you said, in life in general. And so whether or not you get to the finish line being your show and, and you win, you're victorious, first place, even Mr. Olympia, you know, that's great, that's the goal, but if you don't, if you fall short of that goal, for one, you can take pride in the fact that you did absolutely everything you possibly could to be your best, but you're still winning because you're getting something out of it. You're becoming a stronger, better version of yourself. And ultimately, that's what we should all want above anything, above a first place trophy, right? Um, so again, the goal is to go and and, and, and place first and, and, and win and, continue to improve your physique, but there's so much that you can improve on with your character, with yourself and leveling up who you are as a person through, like I said, this, the process of bodybuilding and the, uh, the lifestyle that, that we're living. Yeah, man. I think that you win by just getting on that stage. Yeah, I really do. Yeah. And I think that it's our form of fitness religion. And I feel like that lifestyle mm -hmm. is what really helps create the Arnold Schwarzeneggers of this world yeah. and making all of the leaders within our organization, mm -hmm. what made them so good at what they're at because of the discipline That's right. and being able to focus on a goal and not giving up because it, that's why bodybuilders have such a true sense of being, of understanding of sacrifice. And I think that that's why this conversation we're having now is so important. It's just, it gives me, you know, goosebumps yeah. because what it's doing is it's allowing us to share what goes on because we're always looking to improve, right? And I'm, you start to, um, you start to actually appreciate the struggles. That's the thing is like when you've never went through many hardships or put yourself in a position where you had to really dig deep and grind, then it's, it's hard to appreciate being in that in that valley, so to speak, right? Being in the grind, in the struggle, in the challenge. But once you've done it over and over and over, and you've, and you've just, you continue to fall through and you persevere, um, you start to learn to appreciate those moments of struggle. And you realize it's not just about um, the short-term results. It's also about, you know, the long-term character building. But real quick, let me speak on terms of mind, body, and spirit. Right. So, yes, we're working on the body. Yes, we're working on the mind. But when you're going through those struggles and those challenges and it's like I said, you're digging deep and it's it, like literally you have no more to give. You're like all of a sudden you just go, God, just give me the energy. Just just give me just what I need to get through this. Oh, well, now we're talking about the spirit. Now we're talking about calling on a higher power to get me through this challenge. Now we start appreciating it because we realize that it's it's we can't do it alone then you create this intimate bond with you know with god that you realize like again i can't do it alone i need you i need you to give me um that energy i need you to give me the strength i need you to give me that mental fortitude uh to to be able to get through this training session to be able to get through this day um or whatever it is so for me <sighs> We're talking about bodybuilding. Yeah, um, again, we wanna win, we wanna focus on on that competition, but I've learned so much to appreciate um, the challenging moments. And it's not easy, because when you're going through it, if it, if it was easy, it would be- It's really hard to appreciate when you're in the middle of the shit. Right, it's, it's hard because it's a challenge. If it, wasn't, if it wasn't hard, then it wouldn't be challenging, right? So- but, but was there a time during this prep that you said, you know, like I know last year we had several times yeah. where when you got sick with a skin issue, mm -hmm. then you had the digestive issues. 
then you had the crazy amount of water retention. Mm -hmm. All of those things that were happening because your body had a lot of inflammation. Right. Did Where was the, I guess, the darkest point of your prep for this year? There were definitely several days where um, I told my wife, I'm like, babe, this is, this is getting really, really hard. Um, I'm really having to dig deep right now. And uh, she would just reassure me. She said, like, you got this, babe. Like, actually, we got this because you know, she has my back. So she said, we got this. You know, nobody works harder than you. You know, you only got this many days or weeks left. You know, you're going to do it. You always do it. Um, and I would always say, I know, I know. But I just, it's just getting really, really tough right now. I would say around the time when I came out here, about four weeks out was when we started to really dig deep. And that was the first moment of like, man, this is, this is very challenging right now. And then we still had four weeks left. So for me, that was the time you trained with Hottie. Yes. That was, those were some of the hardest workouts that I had all year because I, I was traveling. Um, I was really, that was when we were restric restricted the food the most and the cardio was still higher. Uh, because after that we started to kind of shift things to where mm -hmm. I was able to, maybe eat a little bit more food and not mm -hmm. have to do quite as much cardio. So that was kind of like the peak was when I was out here with Hadi and you. Um, but we how, how was that? Like, Oh yeah. You, let me tell you. Yeah. Uh, that was awesome. Very much needed. Like training with you and Hadi, having Hadi there. Cause he's a, he is a workhorse. He's an animal. He, he loves to train hard. He loves to train heavy. And so do I. So that was super motivating to me, not because he was the current champion or anything like that, or I was you know, coming to challenge him. It was just because the fact that how hard he works and how much he was pushing himself pushed me. So I think that coming out here four weeks out from the Olympia really motivated me to take that back home and step up my game in the gym those last few weeks. So that was great. But um, I th real quick to finish your first question was, I think from four weeks to two weeks was mm -hmm. probably the hardest because you still have, uh, you're still having hard training sessions and, um, you're pretty much dialed in, but you're still trying to etch out the physique. Um, and then thinking, well, I have, you know, two weeks, three weeks, four weeks left. And that's, that means like this many hard training sessions. And I think just, um, that time frame was probably the hardest. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think that you coming out here was good because number one, we want to assess, mm -hmm. right? I mean, again, ideally I would have had sebum too, mm -hmm. but now you guys all know yeah, it wasn't going to be a great fit because yeah. he's not going to be able to train like you guys are yeah. like in the previous year where you were going through your shit. I didn't bring you out yeah. because you were digging deep to try to get the body to turn right. to get on the right track. I had sebum here with hottie yeah and then we had some killer training sessions mm -hmm. killer training sessions and again um one can't speak english and the other one can't hear anyways so because <laughs> he bumps turning deaf <laughs> he's like what what <laughs> I, I bust his balls about it all the time anyways uh, but uh it, it was it was quite comical so if you haven't seen it on youtube i'm sure it's all over youtube <laughs> on on both of our channels but one of the things was i, I was looking forward to is having all three of you mm -hmm. and then i'm like okay well Chris needs to catch up because Chris took a month off, mm -hmm. you know, in the middle of the prep, he couldn't train back for a month because he tore his lat. So I'm like, okay, no. And, and, and then he's going to come out here and he's going to try to keep up and he's, it's not going to be able to look, he's trying to get in a rhythm. Yeah. So we'll keep him in Florida. Mm -hmm. And then what we'll do is we'll just try to focus on getting him caught up while being there. Mm -hmm. Because if he comes, he's not going to be able to hang with you guys anyways. And normally he outside of any top hardworking open guy, he can pretty much hang with anybody mm -hmm. because of how strong he is. Mm -hmm. I mean, you've seen his videos and you've seen how he trains, yeah. you know, throwing five, six plates on, on yeah. a lot of the machines. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, normally like, no problem. Bring C-Bum. He can hang with Derek. He can hang with Hottie. No problem. But with, because of the injury, I'm like, okay, yeah, he needs to get caught up. Let's keep him focused. Let's keep him in Florida. Mm -hmm. And then we'll turn around and we'll, you know, regroup the last week, all of us, you know, in, um, in Orlando. But I think that what was cool is seeing the camaraderie, the mutual respect, but also I think that one thing that I've seen from you now 
is making sure to kind of step your game up a bit. And I think that's probably also what happened yeah. when you got to train with Hottie, where you're like, I feel miserable, but I don't have to be miserable. Exactly. That's the biggest thing that a lot of competitors go through. It's a very tough mental process of not creating yourself into a victim of your circumstance. You're dieting, you're depleted, you feel like shit, you're just absolutely tired as hell, but you lift the weight. And I don't think, you know, I've seen Ronnie train super, super hard, but you now see Hottie mm -hmm. at three or four weeks out at the end of a six exercise back workout doing 200 pound dumbbell rows. Yep. Because he is just so yeah. fixated on doing whatever it takes and however, you know, after doing 30, 40, however many shows he's competed in and, mm -hmm. and many, many years of competing. And he has that mindset. And I feel like you got a little taste of that. Yeah. Of saying, look, man, you can't look. This is this is the, the Mr. Olympia. He's, he's standing right across from me. Yes. And he has no excuses. Yep. And he's still pulling the weight. He's still pushing the weight. He's still doing what it takes. I can't sit down and be like, I'm tired, I'm miserable, I'm, you know, I'm... I'm there was an attitude shift that happened in that moment, for sure. The very first day, yeah, that we were training. Uh, exactly what you're saying. It was just like, uh, I came in, I was feeling dog tired, and it wasn't easy, but the attitude of like, all right, we got more, keep stepping up, keep stepping up your game, you know, like that's, I think that's what shifted whenever I came out, and then the last few weeks. So like I said, I took that and I went back and I just I kept training like an animal every day. And, um, but that's what I love. Like, like I wanted to be trained by the best coach because I wanted to see my fullest potential reached. You know, I get to train with someone like him who also elevates my game. I appreciate that. And that's what I'm talking about with the competition across the board is that that's how we need to view our competition is we are elevating each other. We are pushing each other to be our best while we're trying to, you know, while we're trying to all achieve the same thing, you know? So, um, it's a, it's, it was really a, a pleasure and a privilege. I felt that I got to train with him again because we've trained before, yeah. but, um, going into this, this year was, was a bit different than years mm -hmm. past. Cause in the past I was two twelve, right. And he was open. And then this year it was, um, like you said, you know, he's Mr. Olympia, you know, he, he trains, like an animal he does and um it's i don't know it was just it was great it was definitely um i hope we get to do it again hey guys friendly reminder we're doing a black friday sale for my fst7 app so if you haven't had a chance to try the fst7 app and you want all my workouts they're now available at honeyrambod.com for only 99 cents for the first month use code blk99 for 99 cents for your first month on my fst7 app honeyrambod Dot com, go check it out. Yeah, you know, I think it's going to be interesting to see what's going to happen this year. I know that um, I'm going to see Hadi in, in Dubai in a couple of days mm -hmm. making decisions about this year. Obviously, there's there's the talk about other shows, you know, he may mm -hmm. do. So we're going to be talking about that and say, hey, look, is it going to be sitting out till the Olympia? Is it possibly doing a show like the Arnold? Mm -hmm. I think those are conversations that we're going to have to have next week. But I think the biggest thing is the fact that um, it, it's tough to not be disappointed for me as a coach to some degree because someone has to lose. Mm -hmm. And people always ask me, they're like, yeah, you should be on cloud nine. And I'm like, I'm not. I'm not. And I feel like it's really hard because I want to see everybody happy. And that's such a difficult thing. And it's just, it's, I went through it with Jay and Phil. And I feel like it's one of those things where I'm just like, and I think it's just because I'm so connected emotionally to everybody. And, um, you know, it's one of those moments where you're just constantly going, yeah, you know what? Am I happy that my guys are in the top two? Yes. That was my win, right? The rest is going to be up to the judges. Mm -hmm. But looking back at it right now, what I really, really like is the fact that you guys have a respect and admiration even during the you know mm -hmm. shoot that we did after yeah you know and coming sure. over he gives you a hug and he's just like you know it's not Derek's fault that I lost it's the fact that I the judges pick who they thought was the best and now I got to go out and do what I got to do yeah I, I screenshotted a 
a text message that he sent me after the uh, it was like the next day or something like right. that. I didn't post. I thought about posting it because it was a really nice message. Mm -hmm. But I was like, ah, this was a personal message that sure. he sent to me. But I'll go ahead and just say it simply now. Um, it was really cool. He sent me a message. And he said something about next year when I when I see you, you know, you'll have your daughter and Uncle Hottie will be here to see your daughter or whatever. It was just really cool. That's it was, cool. Yeah, it was just a really nice message. And he sent me like some some flowers or some, some hearts or something like that. Mm. And I was like, oh, that's nice. Or so I sent him another nice message back to and and so I mean, I just I think it's important that I at least share that. Yeah. I mean, that you know that's that's where we stand as of right now. You know, it's, yeah, it was a competition, you know, or we pour our heart and soul into this and we sacrifice so much and not just like our, we don't just sacrifice ourselves. We sacrifice like time with our family. Like he's got a family back at home too. He's got kids, got a wife, you know, he was here for several weeks. Um, months. Yeah. Months. So I can only imagine. Um, Being away from your family and having to do it alone. Right. That's, that's the other hard part, man. I mean, you know, I don't think everybody sees it the same way because well, we all sacrifice so much, right? You do. That's what I'm saying. So, like anybody that goes in and feels like, "Hey, I can, I can take this title, or mm -hmm. I have the title, I'm mm -hmm. gonna keep it," and it slips from them, and they they don't get what the outcome that they were hoping for. It in that moment, it, there's a lot of feelings going on, not yeah. so good feelings, you know. Yeah. Same as you know, me this year winning, there was a lot of amazing feelings, like right. like <laughs> you know, like uh, crazy shocker, but. On the flip side, you know, I'm sure he felt the same way, but not so good feelings. So right. in that moment, you know, I don't think he was thinking about me at all. I think he was just thinking about the situation. Mm -hmm. And, you know, on, on one hand, I'm very excited. On the other hand, you know, he was not so excited, you know. Yeah. So. Uh, you know, obviously, he went out of his way to give you a big hug. He did. And he, and did. he took his photo. And, and by all means, I think that he should have took some time and taken some more photos like you normally would. But, you know, it's really hard to be able to put yourself in a situation and in that situation until you're in that situation. But I think the, um, the ultimate outcome needs to be what follow what, what comes up next. Because if anybody knows me, it, for those people who are listening to that uh, have worked with me in the past and I get these messages because they go like, you know, after these podcasts uh, from people that I've worked with and they go, dude, I just remember we went through the same thing. And what happens is I don't define champions as what has happened. Uh, I, I define people who have a champion mentality of what's going to happen, what they do with it and how they portray themselves afterwards and in the journey in between mm -hmm. those titles. And if you do get knocked down is how you get back up. And if you're up there, how you stay on top. And that's what it's really about. Right. And I feel that what really has to happen now is these are defining moments for all of you, for yes. you, for Hadi, um, even for, for the, all the other guys that are doing the Olympia mm -hmm. and how they want to come back and how hungry they are to come back mm -hmm. and how you want to focus on improving. Because anybody who wants to be able to go out there and, and again, my, my saying is stay humble, but stay hungry. And that's the thing. You, right. you have to be hungry to be able to go forward. It's why when people ask me, how many Olympia titles do you want to win 10 years ago, eight years ago, seven years ago? I never put a number on it because I don't know what satisfies me because I have a, a, a thirst that is insatiable. Yeah. And I just want to constantly grow and I want to improve and I constantly want to learn and I want to use experiences to be able to adjust things. I mean, even when I was working... Uh, there were some circumstances that came up with you and with Hadi and especially with Seabum because of the situation with him that I had to go back and pull in out of my, you know, bag of tricks on how to get him ready mm -hmm. in the last 12 hours mm -hmm. because his body was not turning properly because of the fact when I say turning, meaning the carbohydrates absorbing properly because his body had shifted. And I think a lot of it had to do with the fact that there were some mineral imbalances that were going on that we kind of figured out last minute. And we were able to fix a lot of those things. And then he ended up really getting super 3D. But I had to pull some trick bags of tricks from 10 years ago that I used on Phil. Boom. Let me try that with Chris. Boom. It worked. And then all of a sudden, everything just worked. That's awesome. But I'll, I'll save some of those stories for Chris and for him and I to talk about. But I think that the biggest thing is just always looking to improve 
how to represent yourself, how to represent this industry. We have such an opportunity right now with social media and the YouTube channel. And I mean, your YouTube channel is growing tremendously. Mm -hmm. um, congratulations on breaking over 1 million on Instagram. Thank you, man. When you and I started together, you were like at 200,000. Yeah, I'm almost to 1.2, actually. I'm like literally like maybe 10,000 away from that. Okay. And then um, my YouTube is nearly 200,000. So that's good. Um, a lot of people are tuned in watching all the videos yeah. and it's the response is great and um you know i just I, i'll be honest in the beginning when trevor and i first started working together it felt like a little bit of like work and obligation mm -hmm. because i'm like i know i need to be making these instagram posts and i know i need to be doing mm -hmm. more youtube but once i started to like just embrace it and enjoy it and like think of it like hey I'm documenting, I'm documenting um, my life uh, and my career and all of the stuff that's going on now for myself, mm -hmm. but also I'm putting out the content that inspired and motivated me. Um, once I started like really enjoying that, which wasn't, it was, you know, somewhat in the beginning, but, but at, at first I felt like, oh, I would rather just go to the gym and put the phones away and not have a camera in front of me. It was like a, there was a time period where having a camera there was a bit distracting to my training mm -hmm. is what I'm trying to say. But then like over these last couple of years, it's actually, I think helped my prep. Even Trevor and I were talking about that, about how it's like, like a distraction from, from the grind. And like, I just feel like I'm, um, connecting so much with so many people around the world. Mm -hmm. And like, we're really making like a positive impact on the world. And that excites me because that means it's, it's a greater purpose than just myself. Just, it's a greater purpose than for me just winning or losing a competition. It's showing the journey. Yeah. It's so much more. It's like you're, you're giving, um, motivation, giving some knowledge, giving insight on my own life. Um, yes, I still get to document my own life. Um, for myself and my child who will be able to see me one day, you know, that was my dad, you know? Um, but like also like just building community, like how I talk about building camaraderie. And I just feel like it's, it's so much more than just me um, competing in a show. That's the focal point. That's, that's the goal uh, is to continue to be Mr. Olympia. But like within that, I feel like there's so much more purpose and so much more that we're doing together. And it feels like it's um, it's not just me. It feels like uh, a whole support group behind this movement. Mm -hmm. And so then I embrace that and I, I genuinely enjoy filming, which is why we put out a video every single day all the way through the Olympia. Yeah. Whereas like in the beginning, and, and the reason I mentioned that is because there's a lot of people out there that or like, you know, they want to start a YouTube channel, they want to do it, but they're like, mm. the camera is distracting or like, it feels like stressful or they feel awkward in front of the camera. I mean, we've even talked about that yeah. too, how like I was kind of uncomfortable, you know, mm -hmm. being myself in front yeah. of the camera at first, but you do it over and over and over and then you start to embrace it and you're just like, oh, I don't know, I, I really, really enjoy filming, putting it out and seeing the comments and, and stuff. So yeah, I don't know. That's good, man. That's great <laughs> because I think you're a type of person. You're like an all or nothing person. Yeah, everything you totally. do. Totally, <laughs> you do. But also, if, I guess now that we're talking, it's kind of an attitude thing too, right? Just yeah. how we we're talking about training uh, and like being in the grind and feeling like, oh, like man, I'm tired today. Like mm -hmm. I gotta, I gotta step up and 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 do this workout. Instead, it's like, no, let's go. Come on, like you got more. Like let's get better today. And it's kind don't, of don't don't be a pussy cat. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you're a lion. Don't be a pussy cat. <laughs> Guys, just just give give a little reference. On you that. said that too that day. I didn't say don't be a pussy cat. I said you need to be a lion. And you're saying, and then you <laughs> added, oh, you mean don't be a pussy cat? And I said yes. <laughs> but but again, but no. What I was saying was like it's like an attitude shift too, where it's like um, instead of going, oh, I feel tired. I I got to go through this workout and whatever. It's like no, let's go, man. Come on, let's get fired up. Let's like we get to get better today. Today is a great day to get better. And um, kind of the same thing with the social media. It's like. Oh, I need to make an Instagram post because I know it's it's important that I stay on social media. Instead of that, it's like, no, man, like I should want to be putting out content and building community and having, you know, all of us come together and making a, a solid impact. Like that's exciting to me. It's again, it, it, it when you have a purpose that's greater than yourself, then for me, like that fires me up. 
You know, I like to build together. High tide raises all ships. I love that mentality, something I live by. And um, it kind of removes me from, from it all in a way. Like, of course, yeah, I want to elevate too, but- What do you mean it removes you? Because like, then I'm not just focused on myself. It's all selfishness. If it's just me trying to win myself, I don't know, like me just trying to focus You mean too instead much? of just doing it for yourself, self gain, yeah. you're trying to give it back. Yeah, I wanna, I'll, exactly, 100%. Got it. Yeah. Got it. You yeah. know, that's, that's, that, that's a very important and very strong statement. I think that that's where you have to really genuinely want to help people. Yeah. And I think that the thing that I've seen, the biggest difference in you in the three years that we've been working together now has been the ability for you to take criticism. I think in the beginning it was a little bit hairy because I was like, look, man, I don't know if he's coachable. Because, mm -hmm. again, this, we were just starting out. I didn't know your old coach. I didn't know what the pros and cons were. And you didn't throw the old coach under the bus or you didn't do anything, but you just said, like, it's just I think I was maxed out with where I'm at. Mm -hmm. I know I can improve. You had just placed fourth in 212 and 2000. And um, it was like, okay, um, I'm sorry, 2000, 2020, yeah. I call it. But um, so when when we started speaking, it was one of those things. It was like the feel-out process, right? It was like understanding how coachable somebody is. And this is a lesson to you all, whether you're a coach or whether you're a, you know, a student of the sport and you're trying to be a competitor working with a coach. There's a lot of different types of coaches out there. The reason why I have such a few number of clients is because I involve a lot of mentorship in my, in my coaching. Mm -hmm. And what that means is how to try to grow both on and off the stage, because I feel like it's such an important tool because it teaches somebody how to learn. And if you don't have somebody who's willing to learn, you're not going to have somebody very long because they'll either listen to too many people or they'll turn around and try to incorporate whatever's the easiest method of being able to do what you're telling them to do. So if someone's telling them to do, you should, you know, you should be doing 20 minutes of cardio. Hani's got you doing 45. It's too much. It's going to make your legs go away. Mm -hmm. There's going to, this going to happen, whatever. It's happened to me in the past. Now, obviously, you know, I have a little stronger voice because of my track record and that helps a little bit, but I feel that what happens also is the fact that you got to build trust but you also have to try to build up the team around the athlete as much as possible. So that means that you got to turn around and make sure that, hey, hopefully their home life is good. Make sure that they have a good partner in their life that's going to be able to work with them and not against them. Because for those you know that have all competed, including myself, I had a girlfriend way back in the day who hated bodybuilding. It made my prep miserable Dang. because it was she felt like it was competitive against the attention that she was getting. Mm -hmm. When you have those types of things, whether it's your family members, your parents, your brothers and sisters that are just very like negative, that's gonna create a negative thing. So for me, clearing out the negative frequencies and being able to create a higher frequency to elevate is super important. Being able to create less stresses all that. Now, at the Olympia level, it's really hard to do because there's like crazy amount of stress, expectation. You have entire countries looking at athletes yeah. and you have so many eyeballs and everybody has an opinion, but you still have to be strong enough to not let that deter you or change your path mm -hmm. because if it does, it's usually for the worse. Yeah. And so I feel that with you and I in the last three years, you've been able to take more constructive criticism and not take it personally and be able to absorb it and then actually refine it yeah. and actually use it for positivity where you've been able to grow in a lot of different areas. So I, you know, I, I, I applaud you. I'm proud of you for that. Well, thank you. Because as much as it, it's amazing being Mr. Olympia, but mm -hmm. being a better person for me is better than being just Mr. Olympia. Right. Because being yeah. a better person is going to last way longer yeah. than the titles. Yeah. And, um, it's, 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 it's crazy how far we come, man, because um, we you were mentioning earlier when we first started working together, it was like, it was, uh, it was a little rough because we weren't understanding each other. Like, we finally broke through right before that first Olympia because you said you're like, I don't know if this guy is coachable. And I'm thinking, he's never had somebody as coachable as me, you know? But it was me trying to prove myself to you when you just wanted me to just take the criticism 
you know, constructive criticism and uh, apply it and and get better. And I, and I'm thinking, but I am. I'm doing everything. And um, there was just some like, uh, I don't want to say it's even miscommunication. It was just more like, uh, what would you say? I say what it is is that there was some things that we sat down with. Yeah. In that hotel room in San Jose. That's right. And it was, it was very similar to. Um, Dallas McCarver, actually. And at some point, I'll talk about Dallas McCarver mm -hmm. because I did get a chance to work with Dallas since pro debut, and there were some things that happened, and I never really went into it. But I think that now, as things have, you know, mm -hmm. dust have settled, I think it's time for me to talk about some past clients okay. that I haven't spoken about. Mm -hmm. And I know there's going to be tons of people, and they're going to be <laughs> like, Jeremy, 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 <laughs> yeah. what's going on with that? Or what's that? And at some yeah. point, I think we'll, we'll talk about Jeremy as well. But I think that when you look at things in its entirety, I've been around for a long time, man. I've done a lot of things and I've seen a lot of things. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a right way and a wrong way of doing things. And I feel that when I was wanting to mentor you, I feel like sometimes people, i.e. you at the time, mm -hmm. was taking the mentorship portion of it and feeling like maybe it was a little bit like, no, no, I'm a good person. I'm doing this. I'm doing, you know, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I am coachable. So it's almost like that thing that I always call the I know. Yeah. And and I'm like, I don't need you to say I know. I just say, okay. Yeah. <laughs> That's all I need That's, you to say. That was a literal conversation we had every time we were on the on the phone. That's right. <laughs> because it was you felt like it might have been uh you were just apprehensive and you're it was almost like you were triggered. And I, I just wanted to because you brought up your you, you, some, yeah. some relationships from your father and your yeah. and your stepfather. And it was very triggering, uh -huh. right? Yeah. And when we got past it and said, hey, look, man, I'm not trying to yeah. speak down to you. I'm just saying, hey, this is what we need to work on yeah. to make you even better. So can we communicate to that level? And that's where sometimes the the abrasion would happen. And I feel that it was one of those things that once we got past that, it was like a whole different person I'm dealing with. You know, that's a. I just realized this sitting here in this conversation that over the last couple of years, I went from trying to prove people wrong that, or like even prove myself right. Mm -hmm. You know, like I am hardworking, I am disciplined, I am uh -huh. giving everything to, um, I don't, I don't try to prove anybody wrong. You know, like the haters, so to speak, or, or what you're saying, like people from my upbringing saying like, you're worthless, you'll never make anything yourself or anything like that. Like instead of trying to prove those people wrong, it's just, now I'm just more focused on being all that I can be, you know? So that that's why before when you would like give me constructive criticism, I was like, well, you know, I am hardworking. I am coachable. I am. And it was like this defensive mechanism. Yes. It was like, yes. I was being that was defensive. the word. Defensive mechanism was yeah. always up. The fences yeah. just started rolling. And up. then now it's like, nope. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. Cool. Let's be all I can be. That's right. Versus trying to prove myself. No, no, no I am. I am. Right. right. And I always will try to explain to you, and I'm just guys give you guys examples. Derek, I'd ask him how much water he's drinking, and he goes, four gallons. Yeah, I did drink a lot of water. And though. I said, okay, Derek, <laughs> four gallons is a bit much. Yeah. So let's go ahead and bring it to a gallon and a half to two gallons yeah. because it can actually start stressing out your kidneys because you're so extreme with everything you did, yeah. right? But and again, and I just said, hey, let's try to bring it down. And then at the time, what you would do is you would then the defense mechanism go up mm -hmm. and, and you're like wanting to prove that, no, I'm not wrong. Yeah. And I said, no, no, I'm not telling you you're wrong. I'm saying, hey, there might be a little bit better way of doing this, mm -hmm. right? And so then it was kind of like, let's try to bring down those walls yeah. and then let's just try to get the information to be able to be applied because mm -hmm. I'm trying to craft a plan. Yeah. And the plan is, let's see what you could be doing a bit better mm -hmm. and what's going on, sodium. Hey man, um, you know I believe in moderate amounts of sodium during prep. How much are you doing? Fifteen to twenty. I grams. believe in extreme amounts. Of Fifteen. Sodium. Everything was extreme. Fifteen to twenty grams of sodium. And I'm like, hey man, do you have high blood pressure? Well, yeah. I'm like, dude, we need to reduce your <laughs> sodium. Okay, off of 15, 20 grams. And this is a couple years ago, guys. So this isn't this year. But but these are the things that would be. But it was not that you're wrong. It's that. Whatever, and it, yeah, it could be you're wrong to some degree if the information was given to you, or maybe you're just like, hey, man, I got to make sure I don't flatten out for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't even matter, but I just say, hey, let, let's bring this down. Let's cut that in half. Mm -hmm. Let's get you down to five, six grams of sodium. Mm -hmm. Let's get you down to four grams of sodium. Let's get you down eventually to two or three grams of sodium. You know, all yeah. of those things as we turn around and we play with certain looks. 
But I do know from my experience, there's certain things that can be super detrimental, super subs. Mm-hmm. Okay. Since you and I started working together, how much have you backed off even after winning the Open Olympia? Pretty sure you said that, because uh, you worked with a lot of people, you said mm-hmm. that comparing <laughs> no, no i don't want to compare with anybody else let's just compare to you what you were doing oh, okay. before to what you were doing now because again we talked about water we talked about sodium and i'm just trying to prove a point because what everybody thinks who's listening to this is that you must have done all of these crazy elaborate things even the drying out process uh was when i say super minimal yeah. it was like literally nothing yeah like it was just Manipulate the sodium, manipulate the water, eat these potatoes, but eat these type of potatoes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it's also taking these supplements, yeah. these regular supplements mm-hmm. to help you, right? I'm, so, I'm quite surprised because I think we had a talk yesterday. I said, coming into this relationship three years ago, I assumed that I was going to have to you know, step things up. I figured it was going to be a lot of pharmacology, mm-hmm. things like that. And I wish, I'm honestly, over the last three years, I've been quite shocked of how how little that I've had to, to do, you know, yeah. like literally backed it off and improved, but I probably backed it off a, like to a quarter and improved five times as much. A quarter of what you were doing. I don't know if it's exactly that, but I'm just, I'm I'm just say, saying say less than half. Know. Yeah. I don't know. Right. But the whole point is that whatever that is, it's an expectation that's outside Everybody believes that the reason why people win is because they take more. And it's not. It's really mastering the food, the training, and all those other things. It's not the pharmacology that everybody thinks it is. Mm-hmm. And again, I've been doing this for a very long time. I was time. so surprised because I really thought that's how it was going to be. I'm like, you know, he he knows what he's doing, so like, let's trust him. Everybody says that, you know, uh, he's he, the healthiest coach that there is. Let's, But, you know, I know that, you know, this is for the Olympia. And then I'm over here going – man, the dude knows his stuff. It's all about nutrition. It's all about being healthy. It's all about like, dang, like I'm, I was very surprised. Well, I'm glad to hear that. But again, for those of you out there listening, it's not a chemical contest. Okay. You're not going to speed up time in the bottom of a vial. You need to put in your time. You need to learn how to train properly. You need to know how to eat properly because that's the basis of everything. And then on top of that, it's just about recovery. So I noticed for myself, sorry to cut you off, sure. but like, you know, people say more is better. No, it's not. Mm-hmm. Cause like more sometimes just makes you feel like garbage and actually you look worse. You look worse, you feel worse, and actually you perform worse. Yeah. Because what ends up happening is your body just becomes inundated with side effects. Yeah. So that's why I said it's about recovery. It's about recovery. And you'll turn around and try to create that cleaner look with minimizing mm-hmm. that portion. I definitely feel a lot better these last few years. Yeah. And everything's improved tremendously. Yep. And, I mean, that's even off the record, man. I mean, I've said that to you many times. Yeah. yeah. That's awesome, man. That's awesome. Well, right now, we were supposed to do a Q&A. Yeah, how long <laughs> have we been on this thing for? I don't know. I don't know. Guys, how long? Hour and 30. I feel like this is us just at like at your house sometimes. We get to talk <laughs> two hours later. We're like, eh, we got stuff to do. <laughs> All right. But we are going to have to do this because I'm going to end up having everybody upset at me for not having the Q&A's because you did put the Q&A's yeah. up. So we might split this into two different episodes. We might do a Q&A episodes, but let's go ahead and keep running this. And then we'll let the guys that do all the editing do the editing. <laughs>